party without ever belonging to it. He felt that if one was seriously against the status quo, that then one ought to make common cause with the one party, so it seemed to him that was serious about overthrowing existing society and changing it. He never seems to have been under any illusions that surely his own head would have been one of the first to roll if the communists should have taken over. I think he did show on this rather abominable bad judgment. I think that there was a certain obtuseness about it, but it is interesting that he never followed any strict party line, but remained, as one would expect of him, all along an eccentric individualist. After Budapest, he welcomed, I think, the opportunity of having some cause now over which he could openly dissociate himself from the Communist Party. He did it in an interview that was published in English in, I think, the first issue of the Evergreen Review. It's very interesting to read. I think it's to my mind, a somewhat dismal performance, which, uh, again, although he now uh, is anti-communist, does not, to my mind, show any political penetration or particular good sense. I don't think that this is the most serious matter that one can say about a philosopher. I would cheerfully say that Plato did not mu have much political good sense either, and it remains an open question whether a philosopher who is politically not very perceptive might not possibly be very profound in other matters. Now, what is the core of Sartre's philosophy? At that point, clearly, one has to make a selection and people will differ about what is the core. I will suggest that perhaps the central idea of Sartre's philosophy is, and I will here, so far as possible, paraphrase him, that man is, in Sartre's fine phrase, condemned to be free. Man is condemned to be free. And the meaning of this comes out in Sartre's addition that man is constantly tempted to hide his freedom from himself and to live in bad faith. Call it bad faith or call it, as I have done in my little anthology of existentialism from Dostoevsky to Sartre, in which the wall is reprinted along with the lecture on existentialism as a humanism and portrait of the anti-Semite, the section also on bad faith from later linear. And I dare don't call it bad faith, I call it self-deception. It's no great matter. It means, I think, much the same thing. Sartre's point is that man tries to deceive himself about his own freedom. He tries to deceive himself into thinking that he is not as free as in fact he is, perhaps even into thinking that he is not at all free. What man craves, Sartre thinks, is a different mode of being altogether from the human mode of being. Sartre suggests that there are two modes of being. The ones that he calls, using phrases out of Hegel, out of the German philosopher Hegel, en soi and pour soi, the in itself and the for itself. But we don't need this particular terminology. We can say the two kinds of being are the en soi, the being of things, and the pour soi, the human mode of being. And things, Sartre suggests, have a mode of being that is characterized, or so at least it seems to men, by a solidity that men do not have. In this connection, I personally think that Sartre engages in altogether too much jargon, in unnecessary verbiage, which is modeled after... Hegel and after Heidegger, sometimes also after Husserl, that's exceedingly academic in the worst tradition of academic philosophy and that in places can, I think, hardly be construed and figured out. But for all that, I'm very far from saying that that's all there is to it. On the contrary, my whole point is that in this forbidding shell there are 
but I consider some very profound insights. What Mansart thinks wants is the solidity that characterizes the being of things. Man wants to exist all at once. He wants to be there all at once, like a rock, like a piece of stone that's impermeable. He wants to have that kind of an identity. And when you have a quiet moment, when you are, say, by yourself, and suddenly realize that you could also be quite different from the way you are, Let's say you happen to be giving a lecture, or you happen to be a professor, or you happen to be a doctor or a lawyer or a businessman or what have you, that you really aren't a doctor, lawyer, businessman, a professor, or giving a lecture in the same way in which a stone is hard or in which water contains oxygen, but that it's up to you, up to a decision that you make whether you remain that way. I could right now stop this lecture and walk out. I could right now resign my job. You could become quite different. You could give up the kind of career that you have had so far. You could suddenly decide that you will take the first ship on which you can get and go to Africa to do something or other, to work with Schweitzer, to make trouble in the Congo, any number of things. There are all these possibilities. Now one can dress up some of these possibilities in a humorous way and just be entertaining about it, but when it strikes home, when you suddenly realize that there is something of a fake security about your present mode of life, that it could suddenly be changed altogether, that's rather frightening. It's much more comforting to think, as for me, I am such and such a person. As for me, I happen to be a lawyer. Well, that's me. Or as for me, for that matter, I happen to be an anti-Semite. And there you are. And now make of that what you want to. Now, isn't that frightening? This is the kind of person I am. Now, while we don't necessarily adopt such uh, aggressive views as Sartre's anti-Semite does and as anti-Semites generally do, Sartre, I think, is suggesting that the anti-Semite that he sketches for us is merely characteristic of a common human tendency, that the way that the anti-Semite lives in bad faith is only an extreme example of a way in which most of us decline the full and frightening measure of their responsibility and somehow seek security in a spurious sort of solidity. I think that there are few, if any, people in the whole of literature and philosophy who have explored in such detail and with such a wealth of ingenuity and insight the mechanisms of self-deception, the ways in which people fool themselves. This is not something altogether new with Sartre, far from it. For example, if you read Anna Karenina by Tolstoy, you may find, to your surprise perhaps, that this is one of the themes that runs all through the book. To the best of my knowledge, it's not a point that has been widely noted or that has been made in print, but I think it is one of Tolstoy's central preoccupations too to point out how people deceive themselves. It's interesting how often the word self-deception and deceived himself and did not want to know, phrases like that, how often they occur in Anna Karenina. So I'm not trying to say this is something altogether novel in Sartre. Obviously it isn't. But I think that if you consider that some other people tried their hand before it, and some very formidable and wonderful people like Tolstoy, it's doubly remarkable that Sartre should have come up with so much that is so good on this subject. And now by way of leading into morality from there, there's of course one person who explored self-deception a little earlier than Sartre, and that is Sigmund Freud. And Sartre devotes a section of his main work, Being and Nothingness, to what he calls existential psychoanalysis. He isn't, I think, in that quite as emphatic as he might be, uh, 
about making clear that Freud has some priority here, that Freud developed psychoanalysis, and that now Jean-Paul Sartre is trying to introduce some variations. At times it almost sounds as if it were a well-known fact that, of course, there are two kinds of psychoanalysis, Freudian and Sartrean. But there is one important difference which I think much less separates Sartre from Freud than it separates Sartre from many followers of Freud, and not only from followers of Freud, but quite especially from the large lay following that Freud enjoys, the people who have read some Freud and use him, how? Well, precisely to do what Sartre is most preoccupied with attacking, namely to deceive themselves about their freedom, to live in bad faith, to hide from themselves their freedom. I don't think that this amounts to a very fatal attack on Sigmund Freud himself. It's not a point that in this lecture I want to go into deeply. But I think that Sartre is clearly right that many people who have read Freud tend to say, as if it were obvious, well, this is the way I am, and of course it's all the fault of my governor, so all the fault of my father or my mother, the way I was brought up, and something happened to me when I was two, and that accounts for the way I am. So this is a way, according to Sartre, of self-deception, of living in bad faith, of hiding your freedom from yourself. Here, Freud himself, who went out to attack self-deception, has been quickly made into another instrument and tool of self-deception. That what I've been saying amounts in a way to suggesting, and this on purpose, that Sartre's central inspiration is moral, that Sartre's central concern is in a way that of a moralist. For all that, it is a fact that his major work ends with a promise that he will, before long, give us an ethic, and he has not so far been able to give us an ethic that satis satisfies himself. He has not worked out a book on ethics. But for all that, I think in all of his work, deeply moral concerns are implicit. And so I shall now suggest what I think are Sartre's major insights about morality. Number one, he clearly denies that there is any absolute morality. He clearly denies that there are any moral facts, facts that are simply there for us to recognize and to conform to. Another way of putting this is to say that his view of morality is anti-Platonic. Plato, in an important sense, believed, even if Socrates before him didn't, Plato believed that there were forms, ideas, beyond this world of justice and temperance and courage and other virtues, also a form of the good, and that it was up to us to see these forms, to have a vision of them, and if we couldn't, and most of us can, then to listen to people who have had such a vision. In other words, according to Plato, there are, as it were, moral facts which man should realize and then conform to in his life. Many religious people look at it similarly, that there are certain things that as a matter of fact are good and evil, and that man should recognize these and live accordingly. Sartre, on the other hand, denies absolute morality and suggests that morality is a matter of choice, not just a matter of choosing whether I want to be a good boy or a bad boy, but a matter of choosing moral codes, of choosing what I am to consider moral and immoral. I don't know whether this so far would strike let us say, the majority of this particular audience as particularly radical, very likely not, very likely, so far, a very large percentage of modern intellectuals would not only go along, but even say, well, surely that's a commonplace. But Sartre goes further. 
he suggests further that there is no human nature. He says there is no human nature. Now what does this mean? There are some people, notably including some of Freud's most famous followers who are critical of him, who have tried to develop a more or less absolute ethic, a humanistic ethic, by way of suggesting that there is a human nature and that once you recognize what this human nature is, it becomes obvious that some things are good for it and other things are bad for it. You only have to be a doctor, that is the suggestion here, to realize that some things will ruin the patient and others will make him function properly. And this means that, after all, everything isn't so bad, everything isn't so serious, everything isn't so critical. There are certain things that are good for all men, and there are other things that are bad for all men. This is a very comforting view, and I dare say an extremely popular view. And uh, very large numbers of educated intellectual people who agree that in the old platonic or religious sense there are no absolute values assume that in this sense you can somehow reinstate a universal and up to a point absolute morality. Sartre does not agree with this. He thinks that there's no human nature for which some things are good and some bad, but that, and I quote him again, man makes himself. That man decides what is good for him and what is bad for him, and that man has to choose here. And that if he kids himself into thinking that there are certain things that just plain are good for people, or that just plain are bad for people, Sartre would say, he engages once again in his favorite game of self-deception. He once again lives in bad faith. Now, it may of course be suggested, and is often suggested, by the people who use the strategy that I have just outlined, that uh, not only are there things that are good for all men and that are bad for all men, but that of course this isn't new at all, but that all the great religious teachers of mankind agree that they have all taught the same things, that there is a significant moral agreement and that in this way the latest science and the oldest religions agree. Is this view right, which is so popular, or is it possible that Sarat is more profound at this point? I would side with Sarat on this. I do not agree that human nature being what it is, certain kinds of behavior are bound to be disastrous and to bring unhappiness, let's say, for example, murder, theft, polygamy, dishonesty, while on the other hand, altruism, monogamy, and honesty are the best policy. I don't agree with that in quite that way. And of course, this last way of putting it sounds cynical, while the people who put forward uh, this view bend over backwards not to be cynical, they avoid all cynicism, and they appeal not only to anthropology, sociology, above all psychology, but they also make frequent and respectful bows to mankind's greatest moral teachers. And just as there is a ready-made audience for archaeologists who claim to prove that the Bible was right, there's also a ready-made audience for social scientists who pro prove the great religious teachers right. If one engages in that sort of thing, uh, one can hardly fail, at least as far as popularity goes. But there are a number of things that are wrong with it. The first one is that the great religious teachers of mankind did not agree about morality. I won't go into any very great detail about that in this lecture. There will be opportunity if some of you want to challenge me about this in the discussion to uh, engage further in argument about this. I'll just point out 
that even the people who claim that the great religious teachers of mankind agree are forced very soon to uh, say that, of course, some of the so-called great religious teachers were not really great, that some of them were very bad. We somehow have to separate out here the good religious teachers and the bad religious teachers, at which point this particular appeal, so far as I can see, uh, breaks down completely. In that case, we might say some religious teachers agree, but others don't agree, and if the only way we have of finding out which ones are right is not by looking to them, but by examining the facts, then the appeal to authority crumbles. But when that does crumble, then I think the second fault of this strategy, which alone is crucial, meets the eye. And that is that science can present facts, but it does not establish any standards. It might conceivably show us what makes people happy and what does not. It might tell us what conditions favor a great burst of poetic creativity and what don't. What conditions make for excellence in sculpture, for great architecture, and what conditions don't. What conditions make for impressive music and what conditions don't? Always assuming here, of course, that we can agree on what is great music, great architecture, great sculpture, and so forth, which is a moot point. One might also possibly expect that scientists can tell us what social arrangements or what kind of behavior has promoted major scientific breakthroughs. But what science cannot tell us is what goals we should choose. Whether we should choose happiness or scientific breakthroughs or excellence in sculpture or in poetry or in music. Now what of course is immensely popular is to tell people that they can have everything. Everything and heaven too. There's no need to make any choices at all, a maximum of pleasure and of science and of art and of philosophy and of music, of morality, of comfort, of high standard of living, of religion, liberty, poetry, can all be had if we will only learn the art of loving. Or to put... <laughs> There's a biblical formulation of it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Or in modern ease, become a chewer, and all these things shall be yours as well. But to my mind, this is really a view that is the quintessence of immaturity, besides being thoroughly unscientific. One sees here the world in black and white. On the one side, there's Jesus, justice, joy, love, truth, Freud, and all the good guys. And on the other side, you get guile, gloom, guilt, tyrants, totalitarians. And then, in this extremely simple-minded scheme, no serious decisions have to be made anymore. It's obvious. Who is going to choose the side that has such guys as Hitler and Stalin in there. Nobody wants that. And it's suggested that all the others are on the goody gumdrop side, so we don't have to make any choices. But this isn't so. This is so for people who don't want to grow up, that they have the idea that one doesn't have to make choices, that everything is simple. It looks as if moral conduct had here been reduced simply to psychological maturity. That we don't have to grow up and face the frightening complexities of life. We are saved from all serious choices, serious quandaries, from dread responsibility. There's no need anymore for tragedy. We can have all good things without missing anything worth having. But I think Sartre, for this much more tragic view, is much more nearly right here. Take a very simple issue that should be much on our minds these days. The people who say our survival is at stake and may hinge on agreement on some absolute morality. Now what then is the standard? Should it be survival at any price? Would it be better for humanity to endure for a few more thousand years under a Hitler or in Huxley's brave new world 
or in some ant-like state, but drastically reduced potential, or on the other hand, let us say, to have a final great flowering of culture far exceeding anything yet known, and then to perish nobly. I don't want to say that this is a black and white choice. It's a difficult choice, and one has to discuss it and consider it. And I think each of us must decide, after painstaking reflection and discussion, what he is to value ultimately. Some people say monogamy is clearly right because there are approximately equal numbers of men and women, and so it follows that this is the best arrangement. But in Germany, for example, at the end of World War II, there were ever so many more women than men. Should we then conclude that, of course, in that situation, it's all right for one man to have many wives, and in other countries, for one woman to have many husbands, but in most countries, monogamy should be the rule. Or might we not have to face the possibility, which Plato, much more radical, did face, that perhaps the whole institution of marriage might be a bad thing, and perhaps under certain circumstances ought to be abolished. What I'm trying to do here is not solve these problems at all for you, but lend some substance to such suggestion that we do ultimately in morality have to make choices, and that we can turn to some daddy figure who will tell us, I have studied religion, or I have studied science, or psychology, or medicine, or what have you, and I'll tell you what's good for you. No appeal to science. No appeal to expediency can settle the central moral questions which concern ultimate standards. Because what is expedient, what is good in this instrumental sense, always depends on what your goal is. And while science may tell us how various goals can or cannot be reached, it does not tell us what goals to seek. Now, the enormous question that a man like Sartre faces, after having said something of this sort, and of course much of the detail here was mine rather than his, a way of lending substance to what I take it is his view, the enormous problem that he faces is whether he is not now confronted with moral anarchy. How can he, if he says there is no such human nature, we have to choose our standards, how can he then avoid complete moral anarchy? And I think he has not found the answer to this question, though he has tried. The big question, if you want to put it differently, is how can he distinguish between a responsible choice and an irresponsible choice? Well, this is what he tried to do in his famous lecture on existentialism is a humanism, and I think that that attempt in his lecture was clearly a failure. I think it was very ill-considered. What he suggested, and I'll make a very long story, very short here, what he suggested is tingled the responsible choice from the irresponsible one, what he thought warranted his rebuttal of any charge of anarchy, what warranted him in saying that there was responsibility possible after all, was that nothing can be better for us unless it's better for all. And this, I think, is very clearly wrong. And I find it quite astonishing that a man as steeped in André Vide and Friedrich Nietzsche as Sartre is, should have said that nothing can be better for us unless it's better for all, seeing that as I read André Gide's novels and as I read Nietzsche's philosophy, this is their bête noire. This is the thing that they were fighting against all the time, this idea that nothing can be better for us unless it's better for all. Now what Sartre wants to do is in this way introduce responsibility. And how it doesn't work comes out beautifully in his own example. If he says, I decide to marry and to have children, even though this decision proceeds simply from my situation, from my passion or my desire, I am thereby committing not only myself, but humanity as a whole to the practice of monogamy. I am thus responsible for myself and for all men, and I am creating a certain image of man as I would have him to be. In fashioning myself, 
I fashion man. That in a lecture I think is fine rhetoric and it's a noble conclusion, but it doesn't stand up. If I marry one wife, I'm not necessarily implying that monogamy is better for all. It's not at all irrational or irresponsible to suggest that I propose to make a go of it with this one wife without having any wish whatever to limit other people who have more money or who are sexually different inclined or who find themselves in quite a different situation or environment from behaving quite differently, not marrying at all or having more than one wife. Similarly, if I choose to have two children, I needn't object to other couples having either no children at all or one or three or more. When we consider choosing a profession or writing a book, the point is even more obvious, surely. When I elect to become a philosopher, I don't imply that such a career is better for all. It's quite conceivable, although I'm not trying to make any great confession now, it's conceivable that I would prefer being a great composer, or that I would prefer being a Michelangelo, but that I find that I haven't got what it takes. Now that wouldn't mean that if therefore I become a philosopher, that I should feel that other people more fortunate than I should become philosophers too, or the other way around, that others who happen to lack whatever gifts I might have, or to follow my example. Take a still more specific case, which leads it utterly to the absurd, and that is suppose that I decide to write a certain book. Now, in that case, surely, I don't want everybody to write that book. If I knew that even one other guy was writing that kind of a book, I would want to change mine. So I think that in his attempt to meet the charge of irresponsibility, Sartre has failed. And here I will just take a swipe at somebody else, uh, being very close now to my conclusions, and we can explore that more in the discussion if you want to. I think Camus is another man who has failed at that point. Camus, too, somehow wants people to make responsible choices, thinks there is nothing that is absolutely right for everybody, but I think has been unable to give a criterion for what makes some choices better than others. This comes out very movingly in what many people consider his greatest work, La Peste, The Plague, where the central character, a doctor, takes the attitude that if a man wants to leave the town and turn his back on the rest of mankind and just seek his own happiness, well, no reason can be given why he shouldn't do that. But, on the other hand, he wishes that such a man wouldn't blame him for doing what he does. Here you have a resignation in the face of this problem. And with this I come to my conclusion. I think that existentialism has the enormous virtue of recognizing the nature of the modern crisis, which I think other philosophers on the whole have not been doing. And further, existentialists have occasionally diagnosed this crisis exceedingly well, nor have they been defeatist about it. But when it comes to their positive prescriptions, I think it's fair to say that this has been, on the whole, their weakest part. If you turn to somebody like Kierkegaard, he suggests that we should throw reason out the window. When it comes to Sartre trying to reintroduce responsibility, he fails. But too many English-speaking philosophers have been playing ostrich, and it's a good thing to have people who face up to a crisis and diagnose it honestly, even if they don't quite know what to do about it. And here, then, is another answer to the question which I have tried to answer at the end of the first lecture, and at the beginning of the second lecture, and now again at the end of the third, why one should study men with terrible views not because of their occasionally terrible prescriptions. Plato, too, offered some perfectly dreadful prescriptions, but rather because they face up to problems and see connections that other people don't see. You might ask in the end whether I think that some of these problems can be solved, 
And the answer is that I have tried to solve some of these problems, particularly some of the ones that I've been talking about today, in my next book, The Faith of a Heretic, which Doubleday will publish next summer, but I don't think that this is the time for going into my own solution because my topic is existentialism and the modern crisis.